Thank you for listening to Crossroads Community Church of Jefferson Hills. At Crossroads, our mission is to be the church by sharing and showing the love of Christ and inviting others to be recipients of Christ's love. Now, here is this week's message from Pastor Floyd Hughes. Good morning, Crossroads. Uh, welcome to our Sunday morning worship celebration. Uh, where we love celebrating Jesus, um, especially because we can, because there are many countries and communities and cultures where they cannot celebrate Jesus, where um, people gather together to celebrate Jesus and they're either persecuted by their friends or they are uh, arrested by the government or in some extreme cases they're hurt or even killed by family members, or the government, or by their friends. So um, we have always spent time praying for those countries and those communities. Uh, but this morning, I'm going to ask us to pray for our nation because we will always pray for those nations, but we don't want to become one of those nations Amen. where we victimize people or persecute them for gathering to celebrate Jesus. So uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask you guys to stand, and we're going to uh, spend some time praying for our nation and for our government leaders, because as the band comes up, let me share this. This is what Paul writes. We've read this verse before. I urge then that first of all, that petitions, meaning we got to do it over and over and over, right? Prayers, praying for them, and intercession. Intercession means that we step in and say, hey, God, even though they don't want you to help them, we want you to help them. We intercede on their behalf. And thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, for all those in authority. And we don't do it just because, you know, it's the people that we voted for that are in office. We do it so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And this is good and it pleases God, our Savior. And the next verse, even though it's not up there, it says, because God wants all people to be saved. Even those politicians we criticize, ridicule, and think shouldn't be in office. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys to stand, uh, and we're going to pray, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide not just us, but would guide all people, would guide all leaders, would guide all those people who are heading to the polls, would guide all of your people in praying for those leaders, not just the ones that we uh, think should be in office, but even the ones that we desperately want out of office, that we would pray for them, intercede for them, and give thanks for you and your Holy Spirit and pray that you would guide them and lead them and encourage them. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. amen. Making your way uh, back to your seats. And getting situated. Um, really quick, I just want to share a comment. Chris Weeks, who is watching us online, uh, kind of said that she wished the words could be seen in the live when we're singing. Um, something I never even thought about. Didn't even think about it. But something we'll, we'll, we'll work on in the future. We'll try to figure out a way to make that happen. But this morning, just to be clear... Uh, we're going to be talking about, we're continuing, and we're going to wind down, God willing, uh, our, our teaching in the book of 1 John. So if you want to go ahead and jump to 1 John chapter 4, uh, but this morning we're going to be talking a lot, in a lot of detail, about some of the false teachings that were going around in John's day, and some of the false teachings that are going around today. Uh, and John is going to take time to refute a lot of the false teachings, specifically that he was dealing with with in his day, and some of those were the fact that people in his day were saying Jesus wasn't real. And we hear people say that today. I don't know how many of you have ever had that conversation, but I get people all the time that Jesus never existed. He's a fairy tale. And I'm like, there's this historical information, even outside of the Bible, uh, that says that Jesus was real, that Jesus does exist, that Jesus, I mean, people who were like, hey, I don't believe him, but there's this guy named Jesus, and people are claiming he's going around doing all these miraculous things. And those aren't people from the Bible. Those are people from other cultures outside of the Bible, historical writings that show it. But yet people will still say that Jesus wasn't real. Uh, there were also people who will say that Jesus was just a spirit. 
right? We don't hear a lot about that today, but in John's day, what they would do is they would say, well, Jesus was just a spirit. Therefore, since he wasn't in the flesh, we can do whatever we want in the flesh, and then on that spiritual day, we can go pray, and it'll be all good. Like, we can uh, do what we want with whatever we want or to whoever we want. long as we go back and we're very spiritual and pray, it'll be all good, which is not true. But something we do hear today is that Jesus was just a man, right? Uh, people say that a lot today. Um, so imagine, uh, those of you who have spouses or significant others, imagine if someone who never met your spouse, right, your loved one, started telling all these other people this false characteristic about your spouse. So they would say, oh, they're like this, or they're like that, and you're like that. And all the people who heard this person who never met your spouse started believing the things that they were saying about your spouse instead of believing you, who knows your spouse. Although some of what they say, you know, might have been true. Who knows? But they're saying things that, uh, that are false. They're saying things, like if someone said, my spouse is always late, you got me there. I can't, that's true. You don't have to know her, it's just a fact. But the things they were saying about Jesus were not true at all. They're making up these false things. And so this is one of the reasons why John, uh, and I don't know if you guys remember this, when we started, he starts in the book of 1 John like this, that which was from the beginning... So he's refuting them, saying that, you know, he wasn't God. He was like, just like God was in the beginning, he was from the beginning, which we have heard. So he's like, hey, I've heard him talk. Those sermons that you guys read about, I heard him say those. And he said, which we have seen with our eyes. He's like, I know what I saw. I saw him walk on water. I saw him heal the blind man. I saw the guy who couldn't get off of his bed, and Jesus healed him, and he got up and ran out. He said, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. So he starts out to refute a lot of the false teachings. Now, uh, what he also does is he's going to reiterate some of the things that we've said over and over. Some of the things that are are like Bible 101, Christianity 101, uh, and that is that God loves you. Right? He's going to talk about that again in chapter 4 and throughout a lot of chapter 5. God loves you. God is love. Christianity 101, God loves you, but also that we should love others. If you have been a recipient of God's love, we should love other people. Nothing new. He says it all the time, throughout the Bible, over and over. God loves you, and if you've been a recipient of God's love, we should love others. But he also says you should live out God's love in your daily life. If you claim to be a recipient of God's love, if you claim to be a Christian, then your life should look different from the mean-spirited, hateful, divisive people in our culture. Your life should look different. And then he says, I didn't put a slide up there, but then he says, if it doesn't, I'm going to question if you really know God. He says, I'm going to question if you're really filled with the Holy Spirit of God, if you're really a Christian, if you're unable to love others, and instead of saying you living out love in your life, all I see is you living out hate. So he's going to talk about all that again and again. So I'm going to ask, before we start, because we're going to jump into, I don't want to say harsh passages, but some harsh realities about stuff people say about Jesus, and that's being taught out there. And some of you may know some people that are taught out, so I'm going to ask you to bow your head. And we're just going to spend a moment praying first, God. We pray that as we open your word and dig into your word, that you would be the source of all truth for everything that we say this morning. Let nothing come out of our mouths except what your Holy Spirit, Spirit guides us to teach. Uh, let's ensure that we are teaching in a spirit of love, not in hate, not to ridicule, not to demean others for their beliefs, but we want to experience you and your truth this morning, and we pray that in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. 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 So if you have a Bible, open it up to 1 John chapter 4, uh, 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to jump through a lot and finish, hopefully, God willing, uh, the book of 1 John this morning. So in 1 John chapter 4, and if you don't have a Bible, there should be one on the table somewhere around you uh, or in the seats underneath. And if not, raise your hand. We'll have someone bring one to you. Uh, In 1 John chapter 4, it says this, starting in verse 1, Dear friends, 
Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we could spend a whole sermon on just that one verse, because he says, don't just believe someone because they say they're a pastor. Don't just believe someone because they say, I've got multiple PhDs in ministry. Don't just believe someone because they have a YouTube channel or they make a bunch of videos or even because they, they, they say, hey, we're starting a church. And you say automatically, oh, I'm going to believe them. You need to test them. That word test means to evaluate and discern whether or not what they're saying and teaching has come from God. And he says, because many false prophets, that's literally the word pseudo prophets, false prophets have gone into the world. And he says, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. And what they say and what they teach, here's how you can recognize it. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. And we've talked about the Antichrist before, and he's not saying this is just because someone gets up and teaches something false or acknowledges Jesus isn't real, that they are the Antichrist but they are one of the small a antichrists that are coming. Because back in chapter 2, uh, this is what he said. He said, dear children, this is the last hour, right? meaning the last hour of the last days. And as you have heard that the antichrist is coming, think antichrist big A, the one uh, who's going to usher in the tribulation, the beast, the mark of the beast. Even though you've heard he's coming, even now many antichrists have come. And this is how we know it's the last hour. And those antichrists, are, again, are the people that are teaching false things about God. He says this, who is the liar? It's whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the antichrist denying the Father and the Son. And not antichrist being, hey, anyone who denies Jesus existed, he's not saying that, they're the, the, you know, that we're in the end times and the tribulation and they're the person who's going to come in and do the mark of the beast thing, but they are one of the small a antichrists who are doing false teachings. Now, we're going to go on a quick journey because there have been over and over again throughout the Bible where God has warned, prophets have warned, people have warned, Jesus has warned against all the false teachers in the Bible. So starting in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And let me set the stage for you because now uh, there are a new generation of people who God is about to say, hey, you guys are about to go into the promised land. The previous generation did not get to go because they believed the false prophets. So they died in the desert. They didn't get to go into the promised land. You do. But God says, hey, Moses, you need to equip them so the same thing doesn't happen to them. So Moses gives them a mini uh, uh, full sermon on all the laws that the previous generation was supposed to adhere to. And one of the things he says is, but a prophet, and you can, you can, again, he's speaking to them. It's not specifically directed to us, but it's one of the things that we can look and say, this definitely is something that we can apply to our lives. If a prophet, a pastor, a false teacher, a YouTube influencer, a, a mega church pastor, someone on TV presumes to speak anything I have not commanded or who speaks in the name of other gods, there to be put to death. And I'm not telling anyone to go out and kill people today, but we can stop watching them. We can turn the channel. We can stop listening to their podcast, right? We can stop doing that, right? And then in the book of Jeremiah, again, let me set the stage. God had told the people, you have been so rebellious that I'm going to step back and give you what you want because you've been worshiping other gods, following other gods, following false prophets, so I'm going to step back and give you what you want. I'm not, you're not going to be under my protection. And so then the prophet, God sends prophets to say, hey, God says he's going to step back, but I don't know if you know what that means. Because we've been worshiping other gods from other nations, those other nations are going to come in and overrun us and stomp us to the ground. And then false prophets came up and said, this is what we hear today. God is a God of love. 
There's no judgment. We can do whatever we want as long as we love God. A loving God would never issue his justice and his line of morality and his consequences on us because he loves us. And so what God sends the prophet Jeremiah to say is, among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. And here's the thing. If you're listening to, watching, uh, do podcasts from, or going to a church where the pastor is telling you to live in accordance with the Bible, but he is not, he is not from God. He's not teaching you God's word. He's not leading you to follow God's word. If he says, thus saith the Lord, but he's saying, but I'm going to do this anyway, then don't listen to him anymore. He said they commit adultery, they live a lie, they strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They were not only living a lie, they were also encouraging ungodly things and living ungodly lives. And he says, they are like Sodom to me, the people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. And what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah? God destroyed it because of the level of immorality that was going on. And people think it was just a sexual immorality. If you look, it wasn't, uh, and I didn't look up the scripture, but it says there was so much injustice and so much immorality and so much wickedness and so much mistreatment of the poor that God said, enough, right? And then you jump ahead even further to the book of Matthew, and Jesus says, watch out for false prophets or false teachers or false people. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. And then he says in Matthew 24, he says, at that time, meaning the last days where we are now, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And he said, see, I've told you ahead of time. So Jesus said, there's going to be a time when people, and we haven't seen a lot of this. There have been a few in the past, people who showed up and said, I'm Jesus, returned in the flesh. And I don't understand why people follow them, because the Bible makes it clear. The next time Jesus steps down on earth, returned in the flesh, it's going to be a smackdown on this Armageddon-type war. But for some reason, people don't read their Bibles. But he also says they're going to perform so many great signs and wonders, and some of them are going to sound so good, and some of them are going to sound so encouraging that even the elect, even God-honoring, Holy Spirit-full Christians are going to be led away to follow after them, right? And then this is what uh, Paul says as he's leaving Ephesus. He's leaving Ephesus. He's like, hey, this might be the last time I see you guys because I know when I get to Jerusalem or, I'm, I'm, or when I get to Rome, I'm going to be put in prison. So here's something I want you guys to know. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Side note, if you look at this and evaluate this passage, he equates the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of it. Uh, but your shepherds of the church of God, uh, which he, God, brought with his own blood. The only bloodshed was Jesus. So again, it's a whole Trinity thing for another time. But then he goes on and he says this, I know after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Same, same terminology that Jesus uses, except Jesus says ferocious wolves, but the same terminology. And here's the thing, they're in the churches. They're in, the, in every denomination, in every church. There are people claiming to be God-honoring Christians and pastors. But he says, even, and he says, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth. Jesus isn't real. Jesus doesn't exist. You can live however you want. You can do whatever you want. They'll distort the truth. And here's why they do it, to draw disciples away after themselves. This is, this is how they live. This is what they do. And we've read this before. Timothy says, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and they will follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Those false teachings, those inaccurate teachings, those things that clearly contradict the Bible are not just, hey, some man came up and said, let's do this. They are false teachings taught by demons. So, Jump back into uh, 
I don't even remember where we left off. Verse 4 of 1 John chapter 4. He says, you, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them, the false teachers and the false prophets, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They, the false teachers and false prophets, are from the world and speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We, when he says we here, he's referring to the apostles. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Here's the thing that we got to understand. One of the reasons why me, other people say, read your Bibles, because this is the truth that the apostles were preaching, right? And it's important in discerning. You can't tell, hey, are they preaching something that's not in the Bible if you don't know the Bible? Now, here's the thing. And, and, and I want to show you just some of the things that people are saying that clearly contradict the Bible. I have a whole list because I get all this stuff all day long. But I just want to show you a couple of the things. For example, uh, one of the questions that I got is, hey, pastor, for you, do men look good with earrings? Even Jesus, and I guess he meant had no earrings, right? And his argument was that, hey, Jesus didn't wear earrings, so it's wrong to wear earrings. And my response was, one, that's not what the Bible says, and two, Jesus didn't wear pants. There's not one scripture or his Pants weren't even around then. So is it a sin to wear pants? But apparently he says, well, this is what my pastors and people have always told me. And I'm like, they're wrong. I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to be disrespectful to you. Here's what the Bible says. And you can't go by, oh, Jesus didn't do this, so we can't do this, right? Uh, someone else said, the Bible doesn't say we need a pastor anywhere. This, this, and forgive me, this, this just gets me when people says the Bible doesn't say when the Bible clearly does say. So I responded to Anne, that's Anne with, with two scriptures. One uh, in the, uh, one of the gospels, I think it was Matthew, where Jesus told the Pharisees, he literally said, because you the Pharisees are leading people to hell, I'm going to send teachers and pastors and people who know the word of God and another verse where Paul said in the book of Ephesians that God gave pastors and teachers to equip the church so that we would reach full maturity and be unified. And <laughs> some of the responses, you can't make this up. Her responses, it doesn't say that. I'm like, here's, here's the, I sent her a picture. Here's the verse. And I sent it in, like, I have a Bible that has, like, four different versions. It's like, here's all the versions. They all say about the same thing. She's like, it doesn't say that. Again, because she has been told, you don't need a pastor. Just sit at home, read your Bible, interpret it the way you want. This is what someone else said, Violet, and she has been, ugh, but Violet said, to be honest, I'm not going to believe some random TikTok creator. I'm going to trust Bible scholars who have told me that tattoos are a no our bodies, and this is the key thing she said, our bodies are a loan from God. If you loan someone something, and I didn't save the next comment, she said, if you loan someone something, you have to return it to them better than when you got it. And we have to return our physical bodies to God. My question to her was, where in the Bible does it say that we're going to return our physical bodies to God? Well, like, like a rental car. I'm going to turn this in, and then I'm going to upgrade to, you know, the new body that Jesus gives me. And she said, well, here's a verse where it talks about um, your body is a temple, so don't mistreat it. And I told her, I was like, hey, you picked that verse, but if you read before it, it's talking about sexuality. It says your body is a temple, so don't sexually mistreat it, because the Holy Spirit lives in it, but nowhere does it say your body's on loan, and nowhere does it say you have to return it to God. And her response was, well, I'm going to believe the scholars over you. And she told me, she said, you're literally arguing with scholars. And I was like, they're literally wrong. It's not in the Bible. But the, the, and forgive me for go. I told you, this is someone who said, and this is stuff like this is where we get some of the, the people who hate and came up with the term Christian nationalist, and this is where racism comes from, because this is the person who said, the word of God, Deuteronomy 7.3, commands us not to blend with other nations. So I said, let me take a little time and explain this to you. 
I said, start in verse 1. Because Deuteronomy 7.1 says specifically, Moses, say to the Israelites that I brought up out of Egypt and I'm going to bring in the promised land. So my question to him was, you weren't around back then, so why do you think this applies to you? Also, it says, it doesn't say don't blend with other nations. It specifically says don't mix with, and it lists, I think, six or seven nations, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Perivites, another Vite, and another Vite. It specifically says, don't marry these specific nations because they will lead you to worship false gods. And I said, the only New Testament equivalent we have is where it tells us, hey, don't marry someone who is unequally yoked, meaning they're of another faith, they're, they're, they're following another god, because then you'll end up following their god. I was like, nowhere are we told that we can't blend with other nations. Right? But these are the kind of things that people are told, and these are the kind of things that are being taught by people who call themselves pastors that are twisting the word of God to teach it, uh, which brings us to uh, this. This is, and I can't even pronounce his name, but this is someone who said, hey, um, God is out like things we should avoid. Jewelry is in that mix. Paul and Peter were given that message by God. And this is someone who, not just for men wearing earrings, but also demeans women for wearing jewelry or for dressing up. And I didn't have enough space to like answer him, but just so you know, uh, he says Paul and Peter were given that message by God. Neither of them were given a message saying avoid jewelry. What Paul said was to a group uh, in a city of Ephesus where there were a lot of uh, sex workers. Don't Google that. I was going to say you can Google that, but don't Google that. But there were a lot of sex workers working in that trade, who as they came to know Jesus, they would show up in church. But in their sex working culture, they were told you have to dress seductively, lots of jewelry, low cut clothing, show as much flesh as possible. And then they would show up to church once they got saved and they would dress the same way. And Paul didn't criticize them or demean them. He said, you don't have to dress that way. Because the beauty that God has for you doesn't come from your adornment, it should come from inside you. You don't have to dress to seduce a man because God already loves you. He didn't tell them you can't wear jewelry. He said don't let outer jewelry and makeup and all that stuff define who you are. But this is how you get a whole culture of, for lack of a better term, a feminine movement that blames the church for coming down on women and demeaning women and criticizing women because you have a whole movement of pastors who teach junk like this. And this, uh, this person, uh, Karen, and she just nailed it. She said, I'm firmly convinced that Christians who misuse scripture do far more damage to kingdom work than anyone else ever could. Because I talk to so many people, dozens of people every day, who the reason they walked away from the church, not because someone like hated on them or mistreated them, but because someone from the pulpit ridiculed or demeaned them and used scripture to do it because they took it out of context. And now we have a whole culture of people who that's all they do. Uh, uh, jump over to uh, chapter 4, verse 13. So Paul, uh, yeah, uh, excuse me, John says this, we know that we live in him, meaning in Christ and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Jump over to chapter 5, verse 1. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Again, Christianity 101, love God and love others, right? This is love for God, to obey his commands. His commands are not burdensome. Everyone who born of God, or excuse me, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we still live in a sinful world. 
We still have people dealing with trials and tribulations. We have people dealing with homeliness and hung, homelessness and hunger. We have people uh, in other nations dealing with war. And we have people in our cities and on our streets dealing with violence because we still live in a sinful world. This doesn't mean that we will never experience that. But this means the only way to really overcome that is for the person that decides I'm going to put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says, this is the one who came by what, excuse me, water and blood. And when it says water, it's referring to baptism, Jesus Christ. He didn't come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth, for there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, this is where uh, John goes on, and he goes back to, hey, there's, it's not just me. There is a testimony of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. And he says there's several things uh, that testify to that. First is God's Holy Spirit. And I, tell, I talked to multiple people who like, I used to be a Christian, but then I started asking these questions and that led me away from Christianity to know that either God isn't real or the God of the Bible isn't real. And my question is always, what made you a Christian? Because if you were a Christ follower, then you were filled with the spirit of the living God and there is nothing in the universe that can make you say it's not there. Nothing. Because you know I'm filled with the spirit of the living God. So the first testimony is God's Holy Spirit. But then he says the second testimony is the baptism of Jesus. And for those who are not familiar with it, uh, I'm going to put the scripture up real quick. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Now, the word baptism there uh, is a word that means uh, to be immersed or to be dipped in order to cleanse. So John's baptism was a baptism of repentance from sins. And if you read through a lot of his story, you'll see that. But John was saying, hey, just like uh, uh, the animal sacrifices, it was an outward action, but it didn't remove sin. So John acknowledged, hey, if I truly want to be baptized, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, because you're the only one that can remove sins. But Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And here's the key. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the Holy Spirit testifies anyone who steps across the line of faith. Yeah, God, uh, Jesus is the son of God. The baptism of Jesus testified to it. And then the resurrection. When it says the blood in John, it's talking about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The resurrection, his death, burial, and resurrection testify that he's the son of God. And we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks as we head up to uh, Resurrection Sunday and Easter. It says, when Jesus, Matthew 27, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, all of these things happened at that moment, not hours later, not days later, at that moment. The moment he breathed his last human breath, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, which it would have taken a series of construction workers to do, the way the curtain was constructed. The earth shook, the rocks split, the tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city, meaning Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. And this is, if that doesn't do it, if that doesn't convince you that he's the son of God, this does. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and they exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. You cannot have, an, have all of this happen unless it's a, rocks wouldn't split, dead people come to life, Right? The, 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 the temple, now they didn't see the temple thing torn, uh, the earth shaking the moment he dies, and, and any logical person, even though these are spiritual and unnatural things that have no natural cause, any logical person can conclude, surely he was the son of God. 
Now, this is a difficult concept for people to understand. Uh, so um, this is why I spend time explaining to people, like, how do we know that this is true? Because this is something someone asked, uh, curious to hear how you know your religion is the right one or that your God is the only one. Now, I started explaining it to her. But if you remember in that verse in 1 Timothy, it says that people have their consciences seared. The verse that said that they were taught by demons is taught by people who have their consciousness seared. That means kind of think of when you sear a steak, you kind of burn it. It means it's been whatever they're teaching has been burned in, you're not going to change their mind. I gave her scripture. I gave her here's how, here's how I can. It wasn't like, oh, because the, there are a lot of pastors, and I see what they're saying. It will say, the Bible says it, so it must be true. That's all you need to believe. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But also, if someone says, what about this? What about this? And they have questions. We should answer them. But she's made a crystal clear. No matter what you say, I'm not going to believe. I don't, I don't care what you say. I don't care what information. I have given people historical information, archaeological information. Some people are like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I got to step back and look at this because I, I didn't know this was true. Other people are like, that doesn't show up in my atheist checklist and website, so I don't believe it. And it's true, though. So uh, here's what we're going to do uh, in a couple of weeks going forward. After, because we just finished 1 John, uh, we were supposed to go through 2 John and then 3 John. Each of those are a chapter long. Maybe two or three weeks total to finish both of those. Instead, we're going to pause that, uh, and we're going to jump into those in April. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to start a new series called The Road to the Resurrection. We're going to start that next week. And we're going to look at uh, several, a little three-week, if my math is right, if we start that next week, three-week mini-series where we're looking at The Road to the Resurrection. And we're going to start in the beginning because God's plan for humanity didn't start in the New Testament. It didn't start with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It started in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth. So we're going to look at that. And then we are going to go to uh, looking at the physical, scientific, archaeological evidence for the Exodus. Because if you look at the Exodus, what God did is take people whom he loved, freed them from slavery and bondage, and brought them to a promised land where they were supposed to spend the rest of their lives with him. And it's a picture of what he does for humanity because the only way that they were delivered was by putting blood on the doorpost so that they could be saved. Now instead of putting blood on the doorpost, Jesus Christ shed his blood for all humanity so that all who want to put their faith and trust in him could experience that salvation. And then after we finish that, uh, we're going to look at, in one Sunday morning, which if I did my math right, this should be Palm Sunday, the final week of Jesus' life. Because he knew and he told over and over to his disciples, hey, we're going over here, it's not going to end good for me. But it's not going to be so great for you guys either. And since he knew where he was going, he preached, more, I shouldn't say more truth, uh, some solid information that can help us as Christians as we look forward to the resurrection. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we're going to have two services. We usually do uh, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we will have our sunrise service at 7.03 a.m. because sunrise is at 7.04 you know how we do, all right? Uh, we couldn't get God to move it back a minute, so we'll just start a minute early, and by the time we get going, it'll be 7.04. Uh, and a question I always ask, is everyone okay still doing breakfast, sunrise? We always do breakfast. A couple of heads shaking. All right, cool. And it's okay if not everyone shows up for that, because if I were preaching, well, I would probably still come because there's food. But <laughs> it's okay. Some people are like, that's too early for me. I'm not coming that early. That's okay. Not everyone has to get up that early. But, so we're going to do that at 7.03, and then because we're doing the sunrise service, we're going to push our regular service back. Instead of 10.37, it's going to start at 11.07. We'll probably end right around the same time as that. So uh, that being said, here's what I'm going to ask us to do. I'm going to ask you guys to stand, because I want to pray, because there are a lot of people still struggling with understanding who Jesus is as the band comes up, uh, understanding who God is, understanding whether or not uh, Jesus is real, understanding can they be recipients of God's love, understanding did God really love me, can God love me. Uh, I got a message from, uh, and this was about two weeks ago, 
from someone who said, I really, really, really hope that God can love me because I've done some really messed up stuff. And I want to change. And I want to be a recipient of God's love. But I don't know if I can. And we all know people, even though they may not have said that to us, we have people in our circle of influence who are dealing with the same thing. They want to know, does God really love them? They want to know, can I change? They want to know, can I truly experience God's love in my brother before he passed away? And I don't know if he ever accepted Christ. Whenever I talk to him on the phone, he'd be like, yeah, I know you're into this church thing, but I just can't go to church because if I ever walked into the building, it would just crumble because God would be so mad at me for all the stuff I did. And I kept trying to get across to him that Jesus already paid the price for all the stuff you did. And he's not asking you to do anything except to trust and believe that he paid the penalty for your sins. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, God. We lift up all of those friends, all of those family members, all of those co-workers, fellow students and loved ones who are struggling with that same question. And we pray, especially as we move closer to Resurrection Sunday, that we would be able to convey the truth that you love them, that you sent your son to die for them, and that all of their sins are paid for. All they need to do is put their faith and trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.